All right, so now that the intro videos and the psychology videos behind bodybuilding are over, I hope you guys enjoyed those. Now we get to get into the nitty gritty details of training, nutrition, supplementation. So the first video I wanted to cover today was is the intro to training principles. So with this one, I'm just going to go over some of the common terminology you'll hear me use, you'll hear many other trainers use in the gym when it comes to programming, progression, and all things training. Just so you guys have a better understanding of what we actually mean when we're saying these things. And there's going to be subtle, subtle nuances to the terminology that people will use in what given scenario. Of course, there's going to be a textbook definition of things, but when outlining a program, sometimes I won't follow that 100%. So if we're looking at the first few um, main drivers of a program, so we're looking at the elements of volume, frequency, and intensity. So for our means and purposes here, we are looking at volume as the total number of sets performed per week per muscle group. So we choose a week period because it's simple. It's a rounded off estimate where people will usually cut off their training split in a week's time and they'll analyze their volume from there. I do it the exact same way. So that will give us a gauge of, again, training volume is the number of sets we're doing. So if we're looking at larger muscle groups versus smaller muscle groups, we're going to be tending to perform more sets for the larger muscle groups at the end of the week with a higher volume versus the smaller muscle groups, which will have less sets, thus a lower volume. Second one is frequency. So this is how often you are hitting each muscle group. So, or hitting each session. This doesn't really have to mean just a muscle group alone. It could be a group of muscles. How often do I hit legs? So. In that session, I'm hitting quads, hamstrings, glutes, calves. So frequency can literally just mean how often you are training something. So when we're looking at elements of volume and frequency, I'm going to get into these more in a lot deeper detail in future videos. With this video, I just wanted to explain a brief overview of the definitions of what everything we're looking at and how it pertains to kind of linking them together in the sense of constructing a training program. Last one is intensity. So this is where I will differ a little bit from your basic textbook definition. Intensity, if you're looking at, again, the textbook definition is the percentage of one rep max you are using. So everyone has a one rep max, whether it's tested or estimated for a given exercise. And if we use a rep range or a percentage closer to that one rep max, it is going to be said that we are lifting at a higher intensity. And that's true. The way I lay out my programs, we don't really take that much into account, especially with percentages. What I really do focus on are the mechanisms and the drivers of hypertrophy and executing sets in the rep ranges and using schemes to optimize hypertrophy. If we were training for strength and training for power, it would be a slightly different story. And that those percentages and those loads given will be of much more importance. Also, when we're looking at intensity, one things, a couple things we actually do uh, use as a gauge of intensity are the RPE scale and RIR. The RPE scale is the rate of perceived exertion. So this one, we're just going to use a basic one to 10 scale. So one, that's going to be practically like your first warm up set, an empty bar, absolutely no fatigue whatsoever. 10 on the other side of the spectrum is if someone had a gun to your head, you would not be able to perform another rep. That would be a 10 out of 10 RPE. So. As we go over more on uh, my training style and how I like to execute my sets, you will see that we probably do 
end a little higher on the RPE spectrum. As far as RIR, RIR simply stands for reps in reserve. So with this, it would be, again, same scenario. I always like to use the gun to your head analogy. How many reps do you have in the tank? And there's a lot of people that will program in this manner. They will use this to accumulate volume over the course of a mesocycle, and they will use this as a means of progression as well. So for example, if they perform a weight, let's say they have 135 on bench press one week for five reps with an RIR of two, then they hit that same 135 for five reps with the bench press, but their RIR is three. So they're saying they have three reps in the tank. That's progression. So that means that they do, they are able to perform that weight for that number of reps with more ease. So again, that's going to be a, a very good means of progression for that person if you were looking for more data. I don't usually use this, especially again, getting more so uh, a little ahead of myself here, looking at how I program. Um, RIR is a very useful tool to use to gauge how hard you are training or don't even want to see how hard or how far you're taking your sets more so and where you're getting close to that failure point and how far away from that failure point you are. You realistically can hit muscle failure. It's going to be an RIR of zero. And there's nothing around that. So the problem lies with a lot of people having a misguided estimate of an RIR. And that's something that comes with more training experience, especially training more in that style. So next, I want to talk about standardizing rep execution. So all I'm saying with this is every rep of the set, regardless of fatigue, should look exactly the same. Again, this is going to be a lot easier said than done, but this is going to be the goal. When we're looking to optimize hypertrophy, we want to be able to keep as much tension on the muscle as humanly possible. And the best way to do this is to have smooth rep execution throughout the entirety of the set. When things get hard, we don't want form to break down. Not only is this going to increase the risk of injury, but if we're looking at muscle gain again, if we are shifting tension, we, your body is very intelligent at this. Your body is very intelligent at shifting tension to other muscle groups, specifically larger muscle groups, which in this case, may not be muscle groups we actually want to train by doing a certain movement. So by honing in on our execution, we are able to keep tension where we want it. And again, like I also said, injury prevention and minimizing injury risk is going to be huge with standardizing your rep execution. And with standardizing your rep execution, there's a couple elements that go into this. It's a very broad, abstract term of your rep execution. What do I mean with that? One of them is specifically going to be rep tempos or rep cadence or how fast or slow you perform your reps in different phases of the lift as well. So first off, we're going to look at the eccentric or lowering phase. This is where we is going this is where it's going to be the slowest of any of the phases. Usually an eccentric phase to have complete control over it probably anywhere between two and four seconds, depending on your experience level and depending on the lift. So about two to four seconds of the lowering phase. I don't prescribe specific rep tempos as much as I used to. And the value of the number of the, of the uh, number of seconds given in a rep tempo isn't necessarily the main driving force. So what we want to do is we want to move as fast or slow as possible while maintaining complete control. And again, that could vary between two individuals, especially with their training level. But the main thing I always instill in my clients is if I'm watching your set, especially during the eccentric phase, and at any point I, sell, I, t I yell at you to stop, you should be able to stop immediately. If you can't, if there's a slight delay in you stopping that portion of the rep, that means you're bouncing, you're letting gravity take over, and you're not controlling that eccentric throughout the entirety of the range of motion. And this happens specifically at the extremes. 
at the bottom of reps and at the top of reps. And this is where we need to pay even more focus, especially, again, all of this is very nice where we're just talking about it. But when you get into the gym and you start to fatigue, this is when you have to think about these things to make sure your reps look the same. So with the eccentric, then we get to a, a pause, if any, in the fully lengthened position. That will, this is where I will prescribe a rep tempo because it's understood within programming, for me at least, that if it's not noted, we are not pausing at either the fully lengthened or fully shortened range with the reps. And then the concentric phase. So this is the raising the weight. This is moving the weight. This is going to be a relatively quick phase because what we're doing is having a nice slow eccentric to maximize muscle damage and mechanical tension. And then we're aiming to move the weight as fast, but again, as controlled as possible. So this is where we're aiming to be a little bit more explosive, but again, we're not sacrificing the execution and keeping tension on the desired working muscle for the sake of moving a weight quickly. So again, going to be slight variances from person to person, but a concentric phase usually lasts about a second in all reality, give or take. So rep tempo and standardized rep execution will go hand in hand. Next thing, progressive overload. So a lot of people get hit completely overblown arguments happen, um, not getting into any of that, but with progressive overload, the principle of it is that your muscle and your system will adapt to a given stressor. So if I come in one week and I do 135 on bench for 10 reps, if I come in the next week and the week after that and the week after that and perform 135 for 10 reps on the bench press, my body is not going to adapt. It's not going to grow muscle. It's not going to have strength adaptations. It's just going to be repeating the process and becoming more efficient at doing so. So what we need to do is every time we train, we want to expose ourselves to some kind of novel stimulus. And the first two that will really come into most people's minds are adding more weight to the bar or performing more reps with that same weight on the bar. That's very true. Now, those aren't the only two elements of progressive overload. Those are probably going to be the two of the more important because as we get stronger, we're maximizing mechanical tension, we are maximizing how much load we can place on muscle tissue and getting it to adapt that way. But don't fall into the pit of thinking that that is the only way to overload. There are far more ways to do it. Again, maybe to a little bit of a lesser importance. It's hard to rank, but I will say so. For example, say you perform that 135 bench rest for 10 reps and the next uh, on three minutes rest. And the next week you perform that 135 for 10 reps on the bench press with two minutes rest progressive overload. You were able to do that same weight for the same amount of rest reps with a shorter rest time. Novel stimulus. Also, getting back to the execution point, if you are able to have better connection with your muscle, this is a little bit more of an abstract idea, but if you're able to know that you're directing more tension where it's supposed to go, overload. So, again, that's a little tough for people to understand you have to be at a little bit more of an advanced trainee level to really understand that. But I think a lot of people, when they get into the gym, can realize, hey, am I actually getting this tension where it's supposed to? I know what muscle group this exercise is going to work. Does it actually feel like I work that muscle group when I finish my set? That's the main question you want to ask. And how do I maximize that through my execution? And again, that will also be a really good tool or a really good tool for that is filming your sets, getting an outside eye to see if your rep execution stayed the same and comparing those videos from week to week, from session to session, and seeing if they improved. And that's a good way to gauge your execution. And again, there's more forms of overload. 
if you are pairing things as supersets and performing the same weight for the same reps, doing something in a compound set, as opposed to last week, I was only able to do this in a straight set, but I was still able to maintain my weight and my reps that way. Overload. Another thing that's interesting for physique athletes is do being able to perform the same weight for the same reps at a lighter body weight. So if you're at the peak of your bulk and you bench 315 for 10 and then you are cutting 20 pounds lighter, you get that same weight, 315 for 10 reps at a 20 pound lighter body weight, it's progressive overload. You are going to be percentage wise, pound for pound stronger. That's a good thing. That means you're holding your strength. Um, so that's progressive overload. This is going to be vastly important for when you are programming and ensuring your program is working. And again, I'll get into the specific details of laying out the programming, managing volume, managing frequency, having a, your optimal training split. But this is the underlying goal and the underlying message that will be in every training split. So that's going to be the next video. It's going to be how to best set up your training split for your experience level, for your equipment availability, for how many days you are going to train in a week. I'll cover all that in the next video. But for now, I hope you guys enjoyed the intro to training principles video.